So thank you, Dimitris. Thank you all, like the organizers, and thank you all for being here. Uh, good morning and welcome to the second day and to this lecture. So I'm Xenia, and I'm here today to cover VAs and GANs. So I'm sure that most of you, right, let's say some of you, most of you know about this stuff. Uh, so I hope that if you don't, right, it's a great time to learn it. But if you do, it's a great time to refresh your memory. Um, okay, so let's start. So VAs and GANs, right? Variational encoders and generative adversarial networks. So they're both types of deep generative models. Which are types of generative models? So what is a generative model in any case? And this is this is widely used not just in not just in machine learning, right, in AI, but also in statistics as a topic. In all cases, right, given a data set, our goal is to find a model, like learn a model that best approx approximates the data distribution. And uh, given that you're able to learn a good model, then you could do downstream inference and you can do data generation. So generative models, big picture, deep generative models are those that are parameterized by deep neural networks. And we all know that you know, deep neural networks with all the advances in uh, computation and stochastic gradient descent methods uh, now allow us to use, you know, to have a um, scalable learning of high complex, uh, uh, high dimensional data. Always the goal is to learn a good model that given the data set approximates the data distribution. And we have two fundamental questions. So the first one is, you know, given you're learning this great model, then you can use it for data generation. So how can I use it to generate new data, nice data, uh, novel, different, interesting? And of course, this touches upon other areas, right, of creativity. It's not just, you know, it's not just art that it inspires AI now, that it's also the other way around. And you'll see later on in Constantina's talk how you, we can have a lot of creativity in AI and how AI inspires art. And this, of course, has to do with images, right? Text, uh, audio, video, and other areas like molecule design. So that was the first thing to do, right? Data generation. Second thing, given I'm, I have this very good model, is to learn a good feature representation uh, for my data. Now, why do I care about that, right? I'm, I'm working in this, uh, in this context, right, where I'm representing my data in a latent space. So if that latent representation is good, then I can use it for other tasks, not just the tasks that I'm actually doing, you know, right now. We can visualize them and then see how the differences and connections in the original space also reflect in the latent space. And you can do clustering and see how original grouping also reflects in the latent space. And of course, then this is very useful and connects a lot with, you know, data efficient learning, um, semi-supervised learning, and it's all around the, you know, the big umbrella term of representation learning. So we know the goal, we know the two fundamental questions that we're trying to answer. So before introducing these two, I really wanted to show this kind of taxonomy because you know there are many ways that you can split these uh, generative models. I'm choosing here to explain them through the criterion of their being parametric or not. So these and GANs are both types of parametric variable uh, generative models. What does it mean to be parametric, right? If we step aside. So if you're parametric, it means that you're summarizing all the information that you have about um, a data distribution, even a finite set of parameters. Examples are uh, all these latent variable models. A very popular example is Gaussian mixtures. Others are VAs and GANs. Other examples, right, are autoregressive models, energy-based models, uh, normalizing flows, and others that you will see this week. Whereas on the other hand, we have non-parametric models, maybe not as popular, but what is the fundamental difference is that now it's not that you don't have parameters, right? The contrary, you don't want to define your set of parameters, but you want to let the model complexity to adapt to data complexity. So what we're usually saying in theory is that you have this infinite set of parameters and you're letting the data decide uh, how many of those will be used. 
examples, right, from non-parametric Bayesian statistics are usually processes for clustering, Gaussian processes for density estimation, kernel density estimate was very popular, different sort of story, you know, uh, sorry for another time. So generative models, parametric models, latent variable models, VAs and GANs. So what is a latent variable model? So let me kind of, you know, put my probabilistic hat on and just do, you know, a small kind of brief overview of these kinds of things. Uh, as we said, VAs and GANs are both in this category, so it kind of is worth um, uh, giving a look. Latent variable models are a rich class of probabilistic models that can infer hidden structure. And this is exactly what we want to do, given that we want to understand uh, like a good latent space. So the notation here will always be X uh, observed variables, right? For example, your images, uh, P star or P data, because I'm kind of inter interchanging between the two, is the unknown true uh, data distribution, right? The, the distribution of the observed data, which I don't have access to. And P theta is the model that I'm trying to learn, right? This model distribution that I'm trying to learn with the goal of being as close as possible to the observed data distribution. So we're introducing latent uh, unobserved variable set because we believe that that Z explains X. And uh, this is a directed uh, variable model that we're, we're dealing with, right? Just Z fitting into X. And from a generative model perspective, this is saying that you have Z and a prior on Z, and then you have the likelihood of X given Z. So a model X given Z, which then defines a joint, right? A joint distribution of X and Z. And then you can also define the marginal likelihood of X, right? Which was your, the objective and is uh, obtained by this integral over all the possible configurations over Z. Now, okay, that's the, that's the picture. What's the problem, right? In generic latent variable models, because I'm not really uh, adding neural nets yet, uh, the problem is that this marginal likelihood is intractable. Why? Because of that integral. Why? Because of that configuration over all the possible Z, uh, which means that it's, um, it's, it's very hard to kind of access that right, and optimize that directly. Well, on the other hand, given this uh, structure, right, even with simple conditionals, you can get very flexible uh, marginal likelihood. But flexible also usually means complex. So um, this is still generic, right? I haven't really introduced what P of Z is, what P of X of Z is. There are just some distributions. Now, if this P of X given Z is a neural network, then we are talking about a deep latent variable model. And of course, since you want to learn good Z, like good latent representations, the goal would be uh, to learn the posterior of Z given X. It's the um, objective that on the right, which again, it's a difficult problem. Okay, so how can you optimize that, right? So that's the model, that's the posterior Z given X. How can we actually learn that posterior, approximate that posterior? So again, very briefly, uh, I'm in the scenario where this is generic, right? Can I do maximum likelihood? Not really. Why? That's intractable. Can I do EM, expectation maximization? Again, not always the case, right? I need access to that posterior, it's intractable. It's not guaranteed. Can I do a map estimate? So maximum alpha posteriori. Again, uh, it probably overfit is not a guaranteed solution. Uh, can I do MCMC? Well, it's a nice idea. It's, uh, you know, targeting, it will target the exact posterior, right? Because, you know, as you do MCMC, you're creating this markup chain that has a stationary distribution, the exact posterior you want to capture, but other problems are, right? Slow, inefficient, and so on and so forth. So how about a different way? So I'm introducing here the, the notion of divergence uh, because it's used later on, because that's the way that you can, in general, approximate the distribution you want you when you cannot have like direct access to it. So a valid example of divergence, as you all probably know, is the KL divergence, right? kullback leibler divergence. Now, what is a divergence, right? It's a function uh, that satisfies these two properties. So the divergence measures the difference uh, between two distributions, right? The discrepancy. And uh, the divergence between two distributions is zero if and only if those are the same. And we know that it's always uh, non-negative. Uh, now the KL divergence specifically takes this form, right? It's the expectation 
uh, under, so the KL between P and Q is the expectation under P log P over Q. Using nice kind of tricks here, like Jensen's inequality, you can uh, prove the properties. Great. And that's, uh, that's a nice way now to define and determine the divergence between our target and our uh, data distribution. Okay, now why I didn't introduce that, right? It's being used in the VAEs, it's useful knowledge in general. And, 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 and a side note, right? That is not a metric, right? The KL is a nice divergence, but it's not a metric and it's not symmetric. Okay, then VAEs, right? We're finally here. So VAEs, um, one example of um, latent variable models, right? Conditional direct latent variable models, um, which is what is a probabilistic version of an autoencoder. So you all know like uh, how an auto autoencoder works, right? Is this feed uh, forward neural network that gets us input the, uh, an image, say X, maps it somewhere and then back to X, right? I get X, I'm trying to predict X. So it's learning the identity function, function great. Uh, a side note again, right? The simplest version of this, right? With one layer, it's actually equivalent to doing PCA. So this is still doing compression. Now, what is a VAE adding on top of this, right? It is adding that probabilistic uh, nature on the latent vector Z. So now we have this, uh, it's a proper deep latent, latent variable model that maps X to Z, let's say uh, smaller in dimension and then back to X. It has this specific uh, architecture that I'm gonna show here. You know that the VAE, right, is composed of an encoder and a decoder. And I'm gonna start from the right because that connects to the probabilistic perspective and the, the latent variable model that I had before. So on the right hand side, right, you can see uh, that we have the joint model, which was the latent variable model from above, a prior on Z, and then a likelihood on X given Z, which defines the decoder because it gets the latent code uh, Z and maps it back to the original space, great. Now, given that the goal is to learn the posterior, right? So we're defining the posterior of Z given X using standard Bayes rule. Um, let me move this a bit. So with Bayes rule, we have the posterior. And uh, again, we know that the posterior is intractable because the, the denominator is intractable due to that integral. Uh, so what do we do? We cannot do standard optimization methods. So that's why we come on the left-hand side, right? We have the encoder who is trying now to approximate this posterior through a variational family of distributions. So we cannot really target the exact thing. So let's just take a family of distributions and find the best candidate that is as close as possible to the true posterior. This variational family now for, uh, for auto encoders is usually the Gaussian family. So this is a normal with some mean and some variance, covariance, and then these both are parameterized by neural networks. So these phi uh, are parameters that are gonna be learned uh, by the neural networks. So on the left now, we need to optimize that phi such that the variational posterior, so the approximate posterior uh, is as close as possible to the true posterior. Whereas on the right, we have our, our belief model, right? We have our generative model, where the prior on Z is again Gaussian as usually done in VAEs. We have the likelihood that's gonna be parameterized by neural network and we're trying to optimize that theta, right? Again, it's a family of distributions that we're trying to find the best candidate out of those. Okay, so let's uh, suppose for a bit that we have, uh, you know, we have optimize this and theta, we found the best theta, we found the best fee, what can we do? Just going back to the two objectives, we can do firstly a data generation and we can also uh, explore the latent space. So data generation only concerns the right hand side. Now we have a, a good P of theta so that you can sample from the prior, like the standard normal, pass it through the decoder, uh, which means formulate the parameters of that uh, decoder, pass it through, get new digits as shown here with the MNIST example. Uh, on the other hand, if you have also optimized um, the left-hand side, right, phi, it means that you can get your images, pass, it, pass them through, get the latent space, the posterior distribution of those latents and visualize them to see if you have learned something meaningful. 
So what does it mean meaningful? Well, meaningful would mean uh, that uh, things that are closed, let's say, in original space are also closed in the latent space, that the digits are well separated, that digits that are similar to each other are also closed in latent space. And of course, this is kind of very interesting to see how these, you know, how this, um, uh, what's the case when it comes to text, when it comes to images, when it comes to all sorts of data. Great. But I haven't uh, really introduced how I am going to optimize this, right? How I'm going to uh, optimize the theta in that phi. And this is where the divergence comes in handy, right? That I introduced before, uh, specifically the KL divergence. So I'm sure you know, like, that we formulate the elbow and so on and so forth, and we optimize that. But why, right? Do you, I'm just taking a step back to recall, like, why did we actually end up as community optimizing that elbow? So the objective was find a model P of theta that approximates the data distribution. Okay, how I'm gonna do that? I'm uh, minimizing the divergence between the two, the KL divergence between the two. Now the KL divergence is by definition, this first line, right? Is the expectation under the data distribution of that logarithm, which can be split into two terms, right? The first one is the log likelihood under uh, you know, the data expectation and the second one is the log probability of the data uh, under the data as well now if i'm optimizing for theta right if i'm trying to find the best model theta theta doesn't appear at all in the second term which means i'm only left out with the first one so i need to minimize that negative log likelihood so this means i'm maximizing the log likelihood so that's how, by my original objective, I've now ended up in a maximum likelihood problem. So I'm actually needing to maximize that log likelihood. How do we do that in practice? Like you would approximate that in this uh, Monte Carlo way. So if we need to um, have uh, to maximize the logarithm of this uh, p theta under the data distribution, you would sample from the data and evaluate under the log likelihood. You can't really do that. Uh, why? Because it's intractable. So maximum likelihood doesn't work. So what can we do that is the next best thing? If we can't optimize the likelihood directly, we can optimize the lower bound of the likelihood. How does this emerge? Again, with a bit of math here, right? We can start with the log likelihood. Uh, using uh, genesis inequality, you can rewrite this as the fourth line here, like the expectation uh, under the approximate posterior of that logarithm, you can rewrite this in two terms, which is firstly the log likelihood and then the KL divergence between the posterior, the variational posterior and the prior. And that's the elbow that we all you know, know and love. So it's the lower bound of the likelihood and we know exactly by how much lower it is because we know that the elbow, right, as shown on the, the last line, right, the, the log likelihood is the elbow minus that KL divergence. So the elbow differs from the log likelihood through the KL divergence of the posterior, the true one and the variational one, the variational and the true one, because uh, order matters in KL. Now, if you kind of step back, right, and you optimize this thing, it means that at the same time is the reconstruction loss that is being optimized, right, the blue term, that log likelihood, is being maximized. At the same time, we're regularizing our posterior, right? Because we're bringing it as close to the, to the prior as possible, right? We're not letting that variance go to zero. And uh, at the same time, right? If you look at the orange, uh, at the, of the, the pink term, you also, you're also bringing the true and the variational posteriors close together. So I like this, this figure here, right? Because on the left, on the left and the right, you can see how the log likelihood has a lower bound, the elbow, right? On the left, let's optimize for theta. When you optimize for theta, that objective, what you're saying is that by optimizing the lower bound, you're also likely to increase the log likelihood rate, which means a deconstruction. At the same time, if you optimize for phi, right, the right side, what you're saying is that you're bringing those two together. So how tight this bound is depends on the variational family, on the variational choice, because of that KL that is the difference between the two, the posterior and the, and the, and the true one. Okay. So, 
we, we've introduced uh, the VAE, like the architecture, the objective, why the objective makes sense, why I couldn't do maximum likelihood. How do we actually evaluate the object? So I have the elbow here again, right? The log likelihood minus the KL divergence between the posterior and the prior, right? The first term is uh, the reconstruction loss. The second term is, uh, uh, is regularizing this posterior. Um, how can I... Uh, how can I evaluate this, right? You know, let's assume we're doing this first order gradient descent methods uh, that allow, you know, subsampling to do the optimization. This means that you need to have access to a differentiable function, uh, differentiable with respect to theta and phi. Now, things with theta are not uh, that uh, difficult. You can easily kind of swap around the operators and expectations, but with phi, not, uh, not that easy. Now, why? So if you focus on this first term, right, the log likelihood, how do you actually evaluate it? Um, if you take this Monte Carlo approach, uh, as always, the evaluation would be sample Z from the posterior and evaluate under the log likelihood. Now, this again is good in theory, but it has uh, issues uh, mostly around like high variance. So what do we do? A very, very simple trick, uh, which is uh, the, equivalent, the equivalent thing to what, what, what is being done anyway. We introduce an auxiliary distribution, right? A standard noise, uh, epsilon. Then we all know that a normal with mean nu and variant sigma is the same as standard normal scaled by sigma, and then you add the mean. And that was being done there. So instead of something Z from Q, we sample epsilon from standard normal. Uh, you multiply by the, the covariance, you add the mean, and now you get your Z. And now through that transformation, we plug this into the Monte Carlo estimation, and that turns to be much better in terms of variance. So in this equivalent way, with this differentiable mapping T, we can now have a, a very nice uh, update for our fee. We have a differentiable function. We have low variance. And that's kind of the, the main idea of how we would do uh, the, the optimization when it comes to continuous latent variables. Now, the second term, right? So I'm, I'm kind of dealing with the first term here, the log likelihood. What about the second term? Well, the second term is easier. In what sense? So firstly, when you're in a VAE world, right, this Q is, uh, is Gaussian, this prior is also Gaussian, which means that you can also take an approach that um, this has an exact form because it's the KL divergence between two Gaussians. And we know the form is the last line. So you can evaluate that. Or as always, you can take a Monte Carlo expectation because KL is still an expectation. So that term is easy to deal with. So what does this bring us overall, right? Like a practical implementation, like a, a pseudo code idea of a vanilla VA. We have our objective, right? Is that elbow, the log likelihood minus the uh, KL divergence between the posterior and the prior, the variation of posterior and the prior. You would initialize your parameters, right? Theta and phi, theta, everything that involves uh, the generative model, phi, everything that involves the variational posterior. Uh, we have our learning rates, we define our iteration times, and we sample the data. They're passed through the encoder, right? Which means that we compute those, uh, the mean and the variance of that uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. And then we have the posterior, which is Z, the mean plus the variance times the Gaussian noise. Great, so how we have Z. Through the decoder, we pass the Z and we get the reconstruction X. And now it's time to update the neural parameters, which means that we will uh, you know, update them in this gradient uh, descent method with the learning rate. And it gives you overall, like you would run until convergence and then you'll get your VAE, the vanilla VAE. Uh, yeah, a note here is that, of course, there's been many advances, right? Many tricks going on, deep learning tricks, uh, optimization tricks, changes in the loss function, changes in coefficient uh, that, I'm, you know, I can't really cover cover everything. One important thing is that um, problems like uh, vanishing terms, right, the KL divergence, usually there is a problem of that kind of vanishing and being to zero. So what we do is this KL annealing coming in. So this last term here is what I'm talking about. If this scale is going to zero, we're helping it not go to zero by adding a coefficient beta in front of it. And this is the practical trick I'm talking about here. But of course, similar ones 
right? And different ones and more advanced ones have been uh, used in literature. And very briefly here is that, well, I even, like I've explained the VAE, right? Uh, the vanilla VAE introduced by Kingman and Welling in 2014. This has latent variables. We have the parameterization trick uh, to, to do the optimization. But then if you're dealing with discrete variables, you need other sort of tricks. If you're doing different type of gradient descent, uh, you kind of need different tricks. Other papers do weight normalization, you know, other would use Adam, other use mini batches. So, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, right, by any chance. Uh, so, of course, you know, I would uh, encourage you to look into, you know, the literature yourself and see and see the papers per se. The nice thing is that there's back and forth, right? There's always things that come back in a different perspective and, you know, disguise and these tricks uh, usually inspire kind of more research in this area. So let me show you some examples, right? I, there's like a lot of papers that I could talk here about. I just chose a few that I thought were interesting and kind of important in the in the, line, the era of VAEs. So the first one I have here is this Nouveau VAE. Like NVAE, this was an NVIDIA paper 20, uh, 2020. So this was a paper with high quality image generation and state of the art, right, when it came out. The idea is that you have this deep hierarchical VAE but the big picture idea, like of the training and the elbow, is still the same idea, right? You're optimizing the elbow, you do your training as normally, but with this different uh, architecture. Um, and, uh, and another kind of notable thing about this paper is that it was the first time where, you know, it was, a VAE was applied in these large images of 256 times 256 instead of kind of smaller images at the time, like 128 times uh, 128. So you can see, like this is, you know, a screenshot from the paper. Uh, you can see, like the, the quality of the papers, right? This is a some example from the Celeb AHQ. Uh, well, I find it kind of nice. Now, what is the idea? This is a hierarchical VA now, so it's not just X to Z and Z to X, right? But in the latent space, we have different hierarchies. We have different groups categories if you want. Here is the example of three. So we have Z1, Z2, Z3, if you can see. Um, the generator right on, on, on the right uh, is this top-down conditional something, right, from Z1 to Z2 to Z3. So there are some uh, random elements or some deterministic mappings in there. On the left, we have the inference model. Again, we would infer the latency group by group. And uh, how do these connect, right? Because they, you know, they communicate. The thing in blue is that the representation, which is extracted in the generator, uh, is reused for inferring uh, the latent variable. So the blue, the blue thing is, is shared. Now, you know, given these hierarchies, uh, we, are we are learning different uh, features. So this, um, you know, the top hierarchies are learning different things. The lower hierarchies are, are, are learning something different. And that's why this was very good in capturing this global, uh, correlations, but also the local fine grain uh, at the lower levels. So colors like sunglasses, skin tones, but also very subtle kind of uh, features like in, in the face. Another example, like also kind of a personal favorite, uh, the, the VQVA, right? Another example I could not kind of not mention because it now kind of opened the avenue for a different type of VAE use. So now the, the VQVA, right, the, 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 the DeepMind paper on neural discrete uh, learning doesn't deal with continuous latent variables anymore, but discrete. So we're learning a discrete latent representation. Uh, the, the training, right, as the name suggests, inspired by uh, vector quantization. And you can see, again, very good image samples, but also opens, you know, the, the door now for video sequence uh, generation. Now here I just have the image pictures. You can see from animals to like cars and microwaves. Uh, but you know, in the paper, you can see audio, uh, audio processing, speech conversion, video sequences, and, and many other applications. What is the idea here, right? This is the architecture uh, taken from the paper again. So we have the encoder that now learns a categorical distribution because we are in the discrete world. Now this categorical distribution is um, is giving you indices to a dictionary of embeddings. 
So just to stop here, you're not really using that latency that you're learning, that you're using the, the closer to you embedding in that dictionary as shown on the right. And then those uh, those indices, right, are then input to the decoder. And then with the CNN here, you're going to generate your image. So categorical distribution, vector quantization in there, and then back. So of course, now the objective will be different, right? The learning objective will be different. I think they're adding an extra uh, uh, loss term in the, in the objective to regularize things. You can't really do the same gradients because now you have discrete things. There's top gradients going on. Uh, and another important thing is that what they propose is that after like your standard VA training, you're training also the prior in an autoregressive way. And that's one of the reasons of this great uh, quality of images being generated or kind of text or video. So for example, when it comes to images, they train a pixel CNN on the prior, an autoregressive prior, and they give the high quality samples. So very, uh, very high bits per day. Um, and yeah, and I haven't mentioned that, yeah, this paper also kind of avoids this problem of stereo collapse, right? The problem where the decoder is actually so powerful that it doesn't really use the latents, but here it does use them, probably because of that kind of smart tricks on the pride. Okay, so what other examples I have here? Yeah, just briefly wanted to kind of tell you that although you know now we have other you know advances in this generative modeling uh, era, uh, it's interesting to know that VAs have been applied on other sorts of data beyond images that we're usually familiar to, right? On text on graphs, on sequences, and sequences here, I mean speech. I'm gonna go briefly through the first one. So what does it mean to have VA in on text? But of course, like tomorrow you have a proper like NLP uh, session. This is just kind of to, to motivate why this, you know, the VA kind of makes sense. It's an interesting example in literature and, and it keeps inspiring research. So when you're dealing with text, now the data is different, right? It's different in nature. We have a document. Now the document is a set of words. So we're using this back of words representation and you want to learn a latent representation for each document. The big picture idea, at least in this, uh, in this paper, this ACL paper is that uh, you still have the encoder and the decoder. So the same philosophy, the, uh, the decoder, right? The generative model would have this, this, this prior on Z, the likelihood on X given Z and the, uh, the difference is that it's not going to be the standard choices, right? Because you now you need the softmax to deal uh, to deal with the nature of these uh, words and documents. Now, the, the good news, right, is that it's doing very well in this latent uh, space uh, exploration, right? It's learning very well the latent space of the document, and you can see this on the on the left where actually the topics in the latent space reflect the original topics. There is good separation. There's topics that are similar to each other being close in latent space, which is exactly what you want to do. And also the semantics. So what comes, uh, what was one of the goals when you do latent space uh, representation for, for documents is you want to learn that embedding matrix epsilon. So this means that you want to find Let's say you want to find the closest words in latent space and to see if semantically they mean something uh, similar. So, and, and that what, what is being done here, right? If you take the, the word medical here, uh, the model has found that the most uh, close words to that were medicine, disease, patients, treatment. So works uh, quite well. Again, very briefly, another interesting application that I'm not gonna go in detail, right? It's on molecule design, right? Chemical design. So I have this under text just because, you know, here are the molecules being fed in the model have a text representation. And a VAE, like properly uh, crafted and trained, can actually learn the latent space of a molecule, which means that then you can use it to generate new molecules, design new drugs, right? And also predict the properties. So, I mean, just stepping aside here, right, it's, it's, it's quite impressive how, how, you know, this area of, of machine learning has really penetrated new, new areas, right? Biology, uh, chemistry, like drug design, uh, art that you will see later on. The, the next example, again, a very brief uh, <laughs> outline on graphs. So graphs are very complicated data, right? They're non-Euclidean data they have this, uh, this relational structure, right? A graph 
is a set of nodes with uh, connections between them, the edges. So now when you have a graph, you usually represent it by an adjacency matrix that explains whether two members, two nodes are connected. And you also have node features, right? Node information that you might want to incorporate. Uh, but it turns out that easily you can formulate your VAE and your VAE objective in a similar way that you do with Euclidean data. So you have the decoder, you have the encoder, you define your elbow here, which actually take the same form as before. Well, the difference is that now these are matrices, right? A is a matrix, is the adjacency matrix, is not a vector. And um, yeah, and the and then the latent representation, it also, it also turns out to be meaningful, right? You can, this is an, an example from a graph that's a citation graph. So this means that the gray links are uh, citations between people and then the colors reflect the, different areas. So you can see different areas of you know, citations and how people in the same area cite each other, but also outside the area, right? They, they cite each other. And if there is kind of cite uh, true information, then you can verify this and see how this meaningful latent representation reflects uh, in the true data. So I'm not gonna go in more examples, but of course there are loads, right? And, and also an older one and recent ones. The key point, right, is that there's like a lot going on in VAEs, uh, although they're being followed, right, by newer models. The kind of these models definitely inspire them. There's different tricks going on in the architecture. There is a single layer that are hierarchical. There's different ways that people have found to tune the KL regularizer to add terms in the laws, uh, to deal with different types of data, incorporate ideas from other models. Right, so I haven't shown really a VAs on sequences. So if you have audio, right, you're gonna uh, borrow ideas from an RNN, say, and have you know ideas from those into the VA. And of course, there's also many more uh, applications like image, um, so caption generation. There's semantic editing of uh, of images, let's say face images. There's music VA. I have the link there. So. Definitely not an exhaustive list uh, here. And uh, I think, yeah, makes sense to move into the other uh, generative model uh, that we have today, GANs. So GANs usually come aside with VAs, right? It's nice to give them together, like present them together. They have, uh, they compare and contrast quite nicely. So GANs, right? Another uh, latent variable model, right? It defines a model uh, based on that uh, hidden structure. Now, the main difference here is that you don't train this based on a likelihood like before. To motivate this a bit, right, it's, um, okay, we're all mostly used, I guess, to, in a probabilistic setting at least, we're used to, to maximizing likelihoods and having access to likelihoods. It's not always the case, right, that the highest likelihood is the best model, right, is the best quality. Uh, what do I mean, right? We have pathological examples where high likelihoods don't mean good, uh, good samples. We have uh, cases where we see VA is just learning noise or memorizing things. So it's, the, the likelihood can also fool you. In right? You can kind of sample from these two and then define constructed tests, which can tell you whether these two come from the same distribution. So whether the distributions are the same, while you only have access to, to the distributions. So that's what really kind of motivates um, uh, ideas in, in statistics when we don't have likelihood. And that's also what uh, happens here. data and then you have the discriminator that is trying to understand if the data is fake or real 
So just focusing on the discriminator first, right? The discriminator is just trying to distinguish if you know what is getting is real or fake. Whereas the, the generator is trying to fool the discriminator, right? It's trying to generate uh, images that are you know as good as possible, as realistic as possible. Uh, so that to fool the discriminator, believing that they're real ones. So, you know, we have these two components uh, with conflicting objectives. So what is the learning objective in a GAN? Uh, it's this minimax problem. The first term has to do with classifying uh, data that's real. The second term has to do with classifying data that's fake. So we have the expectation of the log discriminator under the true data distribution and the expectation of the log one minus discriminator under the, the generative model uh, distribution. So if you focus on the discriminator for a bit, how we optimize that. So what the discriminator is doing, as we said, right, is trying to understand if what is getting is real or fake, right? So it's penalizing itself for misclassifying a real instance as fake and a fake instance as real. Fake always meaning uh, being generated by the model. So with fixed data, so with fixed generator, the discriminator uh, is trained to, to optimize this, this binary classification task. So with probability one, it assigns probability one if the data comes from the real distribution, the true distribution, it assigns probability zero if it comes from the uh, generator. So this is now a standard binary classification problem. Data is fixed. So we know what is the optimal discriminator, this D star here, and we know that it takes this four, right? Is the, the ratio of the true data distribution to the true uh, plus the model data distribution. Well, great that we have the exact four of the, uh, of the discriminator because now we can plug it into the objective create our new objective and then optimize for theta. So with fixed discriminator, how do we optimize the generator? Now, theta only appears in the second term, right? Only appears in the classification of a fake sample. So what the objective is saying is that what we're trying, what we're trying as a generator is to minimize the log probability that my generated image, image is being classified as fake by the discriminator. So I minimize the probability that I'm uh, not being, that, uh, that, the, that the discriminator is not being fooled by me. So plugging into the optimal uh, discriminator from before, the first line is just a substitution. The second line is just recognizing that those terms are KL divergences from before. The third line here is just recognizing again that the symmetric version of a KL is the jensen shannon divergence. Uh, which is now uh, is now symmetric. It's again a divergence, right? It satisfies the divergence properties. And if you look at this objective, which we haven't yet optimized for theta, just for p, you can understand what the optimal value is. So for theta, we're minimizing, right? So this objective here, you're minimizing for theta, and we know that the um, the minimum value for the JS is zero, which means that overall the best value of this one will be minus two log two will be minus log four because the first one will be zero so we know what the you know best case scenario will be right uh we and we're trying to approximate that so how do we um optimize this in practice right it's this double loop algorithm right one for loop for theta one loop for theta. the inner loop which you have a fixed generator and you optimize for the discriminator we had the binary classification problem, and we're just doing standard gradient ascent on that uh, binary uh, objective, like right? log d plus log one minus d. Now gradient ascent, right? Because this is the maximization, is not minimization that we're doing there. Um, and that's the inner loop, right? So I've optimized my fee. What's the outer loop right now with fixed fee from the inner loop? I'm optimizing for theta. Now it's gradient descent because of minimizing for theta. And the objective is that log uh, one minus D. So I'm minimizing the log probability that my image is being classified as fake from the discriminator. As before, right, these expectations are not computed directly. They're approximated by a Monte Carlo average. So the first one, it means you sample from the data and then you evaluate under the log, um, uh, log discriminator. 
The second one, you sample from your model, from, from your generative models or from Z, you pass X given Z, and then you evaluate log one minus two. So that's in theory, like the, the basic, like the GAN as, as introduced by Jan Goodfell in 2014. However, it turns out that the loss is not exactly that, but for practical reasons, as is always the case, right? For practical reasons, we change things, we modify the laws, we modify the terms so that they can actually work well and, uh, and be stable. So in the generator loss, we're doing the following change. So a generator, like how, how does it work, right? When you're training the generator, you sample noise and you generate output. And then the discriminator is trying to classify that output. And how do you, uh, what, what loss do you assign to the generator? Like the loss is that log one minus D, right? It's being uh, penalized if, it's, uh, if the image was uh, classified as fake. Now, of course, this is very bad performance in the beginning, right? And the discriminator can classify this uh, fake images very well, like with very high confidence, which means that term would be zero because we said that it's a science probability zero if the image is from the generator, which again, zero means not kind of stable uh, training here, not very good weight updates. So what we're changing in order to avoid those zeros coming in is that we are changing the generator loss without changing the idea. So instead of minimizing the probability of an image being fake, you maximize the probability of an image being real. It's a different formulation, but conceptually it's the same thing. So instead of, so the, the new loss is what I have over there, right? You are maximizing for the expectation of log D, which is equivalent to minimizing of the minus that. All right, so then this helps in the training, instability, and saturation, more stable weight updates, and, and that's, the, that's the main formulation of the loss. So these sort of changes, right, changing the loss function and things like that are standard tricks, right? You do anything that will help you to still have a valid objective uh, that satisfies your goals, but at the same time, that is good practically, right? That you can actually run this, you can uh, have, a, you know, kind of a good convergence, you can have, uh, stable updates. So let me go to a few examples. Um, I have, yeah, I have a couple. So the first one I have here is the the progressive gun. So the reason I have this uh, this paper, the 2018 paper, is that uh, it has this very interesting idea of progressively, right, as the name suggests, uh, building the network, both the generator and the discriminator network. Right, so you see going from the left to right, they, you start there, uh, there was just a, a four by four image, and then then this was increased to eight by eight, and gradually went to 1,024 times 1,024. Uh, you see also how the blurred image gradually kind of you know, cleans out and becomes uh, more clear in the uh, details. So by progressively doing this, this helps the training, right? It's much better in training and more uh, stabilized. Now, the second one, right, again, couldn't not not mention, right, the cycle gun, the important paper, right, that is doing image to image translation. So what is the idea here? Uh, you want, let's say you want to have, you know, have the same picture mapped from, uh, if you take the last example, summer, winter, right, the same landscape from summer to winter and vice versa. Now, the novelty of this paper is that it, they do this without really having access to paired examples, right? You don't give uh, to the model the same picture in these both domains, right? Or make the, in the Monet pictures or photos or the zebra's courses. You just give a collection of pictures in one domain, a collection of pictures in the other domain, and, and that's all you need. So what's the architecture, right? We have this translation, which means we have two domains and we have two generators, two discriminators. Uh, there is a translation between X and Y and Y and X. So one generator is learning to generate in one domain, conditional on an image from the other domain, and the other one vice versa. And of course, each generator has a discriminator, right? That is trying to understand whether it's getting a real image or a generated one. Uh, then, but then there's just a standard idea, right? Of the adversarial uh, zero-sum process, uh, this, uh, the consistency loss in both directions. So conceptually, like uh, the training is very similar to what is happening to a, to a simple gun. Uh, the style gun, right? Another nice paper. 
borrowing for, from the, the style transfer literature. I uh, would the idea here, right? If you're doing style transfer, it's you have like a content image, your basic image, and then you have your style image. And you want to transfer the style from one to the other, which means you're gonna keep the, let's say the high level characteristics, but, but you're gonna transfer subtleties, changes, um, unique features. And that's what they do here. So this is, uh, again, yeah, this is a picture from the paper, this 2019 paper, where you have a source A, source B, right? There's always two sources of images and you're gonna transfer the style from one to the other. And in each layer, right? You're transferring different, um, different details. So high level or more low level. So for example, you might keep basic skin color, hair color, glasses, right? But you're gonna change other subtle details like um, features in the face, expressions. And uh, so if you see the, the cross section, right, of the, of the top and the bottom, this is exactly what's, uh, what's going on. What is the architecture here? How do they do this? The main novelty is in the generator uh, architecture. Uh, why we have two, two networks. There is the mapping, there is the synthesis, and there's this intermediate latent space. So here we're introducing this a W latent space. So the mapping we get, we have we have Z our prior right, and Z goes through W before uh, being mapped back. So what is happening? There is a very good disentanglement going on in the W space, which can learn these uh, different features. These Ws are transferred into styles, and then uh, what we are doing is that we are uh, aligning the mean and the variance of the original picture, the content features, and the style features. So we are bringing the styles into the con by aligning those. Um, interesting model, of course, right? Very high level uh, image quality, right? Everything measured here in, in the pressure distance, the standard metrics. And again, at the time, we give great, give great uh, quality on the standard data sets, right? It's a CLA, HQ, and so on and so forth. Yes, and I think this brings me to the end. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed it, right? Brief overview of LVMs, latent variable models, how VAs and GANs are the types of this. Now, they are similar, of course, right, in what they're trying to do, but they achieve it in very different ways. They have a lot of differences, of course, right? Like GANs usually give us better quality of, of images, but if you need a likelihood, then you need a VAE or if you need a task that needs a likelihood that you need a VAE. Um, an important note here is that it's, it's very different. Like when you're trying to compare things or decide what you need for a problem, it's very different to think what you need as an algorithm, right? The VAE idea, the GAN idea, or what you need as a network architecture, right? If you're gonna plug a CNN or a transformer or you know another MLP with softmax. So it's two different aspects of the problem. Of course, many creative applications many that I haven't uh, talked about, you'll see in Constantina's talk uh, in the afternoon. Of course, many other models, right? Maybe the most exciting ones, the fusions, right? They're gonna see later on with Arno. Um, well, concerns, well, I'll leave this to you. Like if you think there's something that we need to think about as community or not around this, if they're becoming too good, you know, that's another, another lecture. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed it.